The Liberal budget gave nothing to the community and they're getting desperate. Tonight, Kisheshawan First Nation prepares for annual flooding evacuations after a decade of relocation talks. The Senate, under pressure from the oil and gas industry, has said, whoa, whoa, we have to, uh, we have to review this, and so they've started this uh, cross-Canada circus. The Senate Environment Committee stops in Winnipeg to hear from the public about Bill C-69. And red men is still in the dictionary, it's a slur, even if it wasn't meant to be when it, they chose the name. And Montreal's McGill University drops their name thanks to a student-led movement. Good evening, welcome to APTN National News, I'm Dennis Ward. A Nunavut family is suing the RCMP saying that a fatal shooting could have been prevented with better RCMP training. David Kalmanek was shot and killed by RCMP in Pond Inlet in March of 2017. In a statement of claim filed at the Nunavut Court of Justice, the family states that they believe Kalmanek was not a danger to himself and others at the time of the shooting. They also say if the officers were trained in speaking in Nuktitut, they would have known this. Kalmanik was alone in the Pond Inlet graveyard with a 22 caliber rifle when he was killed. His family says he was hunting rabbits. RCMP have yet to respond to the lawsuit. And for more information on this story and to see the statement of claim yourself, head over to our website, aptnnews.ca. A very familiar face from Nunavut has announced she will be running for the Conservatives in October. Leona Aglukak served as the Conservative MP for Nunavut between 2008 and 2015, where she was both Minister of Health and Minister of Environment for Stephen Harper's federal cabinet. She was defeated by Hunter Tutu in 2015, but announced today she is returning to fight for the seat. Aglukak has a long record of public service in Nunavut. Prior to joining the federal cabinet, she was a territorial cabinet minister and was first elected to the Nunavut Legislative Assembly in 2004. Well, it's springtime, so that means Kisheshawan is preparing to evacuate. Nearly every year, the Cree community gets flooded out, and for nearly a decade, there's been talk of relocating it to higher ground. But it's mostly been talk. As APTN's Todd Lamaran reports, the NDP asked about relocation in question period today. This community has been waiting for funding for relocation to higher ground for years. The Liberal budget gave nothing to the community and they're getting desperate. This is not a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. When will the Liberals stop playing games with the lives of Kashashwan's people and fund their relocation? Kashashwan is one of the communities making up the Mashkigawak Council of Cree Nations. Its Grand Chief Jonathan Solomon says this time of year means high anxiety for community members. Well, I think the people here are just getting fed up with, uh, um, you know, going into uh, um, uh, an emergency mode every every time of this uh, every time at this time of the year. Kashashawan sits on the Albany River, and nearly every year community members get on a plane, like this one from four years ago. Relocating the whole community would cost between $500 million and a billion dollars. Solomon admits this may be why nothing has been done. That could be it, um, but I think you know um, uh, you gotta they, they gotta look at the, um, the long term in regards to um, the stability of uh, the community and also the sustain sustainability of the community. Every evacuation costs 18 to 22 million dollars. But the most recent federal budget contained no money to relocate. At least to start looking at putting resources into um, uh, getting ready, like uh, phased and approach, like um, you know, um, a few year plan um, to get it going. In his answer to Jolly Bois, the parliamentary secretary to Indigenous Services made no First specific commitments. Our commitment to a long term relocation plan has not wavered, has not changed. In the meantime, we've made significant progress on priorities such as the new modular school, which will be installed in September of this year. However, Crown Indigenous Relations Minister Carolyn Bennett 
insisted yesterday new structures are built with relocation in mind. As you know, when we put in the housing, it was, you know, 52 units, uh, duplex, some of them five bedrooms, but they were put in module module so they could be moved to higher ground. That will be the same for the school when it opens in September. A permanent move for Kashechewan may be eight to ten years away. In the meantime, Cornwall is just one of four host communities in Ontario preparing for evacuees this year. Ta Lamaran, APTN National News, Ottawa. Indigenous Affairs Ontario is getting its funding dramatically reduced. This comes after the Doug Ford government announced its budget plans Thursday night. Last year, the Provincial Liberal Party funded $146 million to Indigenous Affairs. The Ford's government is cutting that by almost half, reducing it to $74.4 million. PC Party is calling their new budget protecting what matters most. But the NDP critic on Indigenous relations and reconciliation says it only protects certain people. I mean, certainly uh, it's a very significant cut and I know that uh, uh, when we talk about Indigenous services and when we talk about uh, the name of the the name of the uh, <laughs> the budget, um, you know, it's uh, it's about people, but it's not for. It seems like it's not for indigenous people. We always want to hear what you have to say. Here's how to continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca. Find us online at aptnnews.ca and on YouTube.com/aptnnews. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for the latest Indigenous news. The three Mi'kmaq grandmothers who were arrested by the RCMP at the Alton gas site in Nova Scotia say they won't stop trying to stop the project. The three were arrested but not charged with violating a court order to not block the site they sat down with APTN News to talk about their arrest and what comes next. Angel Moore brings us this story. <laughs> Maybe it's right. <laughs> Dig it out. Three grandmothers sit and talk in the Treaty Truck House near the Alton Gas site in Nova Scotia. Each were arrested on Wednesday by the RCMP. But the truck house sits on Crown land and out of reach of Alton Gas. We hold those treaties to this land. We're sovereign. We never ceded our land to anybody. Two days ago, they were arrested for trespassing, but no charges were laid. They say that was the plan. Oh, we agreed that we were all going to get arrested and um, that we would fight this in the court. We would fight for our sovereignty in court. They were released on the condition that they stay away from the site. Yeah, we're not allowed down around there to block those workers. Not that on Alton, supposedly Alton Gas's land, which is not, it's unceded Mi'kmaq territory. They say it is their right to be at the river and they will continue to protect it. This is our uh, treaty, treaty area. The treaty area we're allowed to fish. Don't even fish. <laughs> Alton Gas put up a designated protest area. The grandmothers say it's like a caged pen and it's offensive. Uh, they're repeating their, um, their false, uh, horrible decisions of what they did to our people. They decided to use the fence as a tribute to missing and murdered Indigenous women. Everybody around here, everybody that drives by, they see the red dresses and, you know, letting people know, you know, we will not forget our daughters, our sisters, our grandchildren, our mothers. Alton Gas wants to store natural gas underground along the Sabinagati River and pump salty brine into the water. The Mi'kmaq have occupied a camp at the entrance to the work site since 2017. And we sit here in prayer. And we're praying that our people stand up and exercise their tree rights and sovereignty and stop them. Last month, Alton Gas won an injunction to remove the water protectors from the site. We're, fight, we're standing for the water and the lands. We're not self-proclaimed water protectors. 
They are concerned the storage project will damage the river. The Assembly of Nova Scotia chiefs agree. In a media release, they said, the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq chiefs, which is made up of all 13 chiefs in Nova Scotia, has never supported the Alton Gas Project, as we too have environmental concerns about this project. The hearing for the permanent injunction is next week at the Nova Scotia Provincial Courthouse. Angel Moore, APTN National News at the Sebaganagany River. A McGill University sports team is changing its name. That story and more coming up after the break. Here's a look at Saturday's weather forecast starting on the east coast. Showers and a high of 12 for Halifax. 15 above with rain in Fredericton. Plus one with snow for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Two above under sunny skies for Cartwright. 13 under the sun in Montreal. Plus three with snow for Val d'Or. 14 in Toronto. 13 for Sarnia and Windsor. Plus six in Thunder Bay. Zero with snow for Wawa. Plus three in Churchill. Sunny and 10 above for Puckettawagan and the Paw. Plus nine under sunny skies for Winnipeg and Gimli. 11 above for Brandon. Plus 12 in Regina and Esteban. 16 under sunny skies for North Battleford. Plus 12 in Meadow Lake and La Ronge. Welcome back. Fireworks erupted during the Senate Environment Committee meeting in Winnipeg today. Senators were discussing a bill meant to improve environmental regulations when they were suddenly interrupted. Ashley Branson has that story. To the what started off as a calm committee chair. meeting on I Bill C-69 quickly went awry. I'm sorry to object. I really apologize to the senators and the senators. Okay. Again, Chair, I don't we, think that this person is on we, the witness we list. Bill C-69 is supposed to make improvements to a couple of Canada's environmental laws. Eric Rader interrupted the senators because he's worried Bill C-69 won't pass before the upcoming elections. He says his group, the Wilderness Committee, shares many of the same concerns as Indigenous communities, and they don't want to see the bill watered down. It passed the House last uh, June, I believe it was. However, the Senate under pressure from the oil and gas industry has said, whoa, whoa, we have to, uh, we have to review this. And so they've started this uh, cross Canada circus. In March, a group representing 130 Indigenous communities were on Parliament Hill speaking out against Bill C-69, which they say will leave their communities in poverty. No moratoriums, no killing pipelines, no bills that are guaranteed to lead to endless court challenges. I this was one of several hearings across Canada. Raider says the heat is on the Senate because his group wants to see this bill pass before the upcoming election in the fall. The senators and the presenters deserve uh, their place to, uh, to talk, to not be disrupted. But the speed with which all of the science is telling us that we need to act um, that's an imperative, and I think that's a reason why most of the people are in the room today. So we don't have time to wait. Ashley Branson, APTN, National News, Winnipeg. McGill University in Montreal has been around for almost 200 years. They list former prime ministers and Nobel Prize winners among their alumni. But their varsity sports teams have been subject to much criticism for using a name that Indigenous students find offensive. Today, McGill decided to change that name. Here's Tom Fenario with that story. McGill University has long called their sports teams the Redmen. The name first appeared in 1927, a reference to the team's colors. Um, even though that may be the origins of the name, because of how it has been used and the imagery that's been associated with it, you just can't, um, you can't remove those connotations from a name. According to this 2015 presentation by then-student Raymond Grafton, the name quickly evolved into something else. The presentation uses yearbook and school paper references to show that in the 1950s, intermediate teams became known as Indians. In the 60s, the women's teams were referred to as squaws. In the 80s, a distinctly Indigenous logo was created and added to the uniform. And that eventually in the 90s, McGill put an end to all Indigenous references towards the Redmond name. 
Except that as students like Katie Galebrave like to point out, Redmond itself still has negative associations. And Redmond is still in the dictionary. It's a slur. Even if it wasn't meant to be when it, they chose the name, it still is a slur. And to people who aren't familiar with the history, like that's all they'll get out of it. Galebraith, who is Native American from the Chickasaw Nation, was part of a student-led movement last year to change the name. And on Friday, McGill University agreed. In a statement, McGill Principal Suzanne Fortier wrote, Inclusion and respect are at the core of the university's principles and values. For these reasons, the Redmond name is not one that our community would choose today and is not one that McGill should carry forward. Galbraith says that Indigenous students have long been arguing for a name change, and she credits those that came before her for laying the groundwork. She just wishes that their efforts had been acknowledged sooner. We're, we're happy the name has changed. We're not happy with how long it has taken, but um, we're very hopeful for the future. Um, and we're hoping that this is like the first step in making McGill a better place for Indigenous students. Tom Fenario, ABTN National News, Montreal. Banishment is an ancient form of justice, but increasingly First Nations today are using it to rid their communities of drug dealers. Trina Roach is exploring how this works in tonight's episode of APTN Investigates, and she joins us now. Trina, good to see you. Why did you want to look into banishment? I, I did a story in 2017. Um, a Mi'kmaq woman had died, and uh, a fentanyl, it was a fentanyl-related uh, death. She had OD'd. Um, uh, there was drugs floating around and they had traces of fentanyl. There was a reaction at that time that was in New Brunswick and other First Nations in the province, um, there was a lot of fear that, that there could be another incident. Um, and uh, so it was, people had started talking about banishment, um, you know, throwing it around as something they, would, they, would, uh, they were thinking of doing. And Tobik at the time had acted, it's a Maliseet or Wolustaguia community in New Brunswick, and they had acted fairly quickly um, to, to pass, unanimously pass a bylaw on banishment. And I remember doing the story at the time and just having that thought of like, how's that gonna work? You know, I, I know some of these communities, they're very tight knit. Um, how will you enforce it? I just had a lot of questions. And so, uh, so I just decided to, to, to take a look and see how it was working out two years later. And so what did you find? How did it work? Well, you know, there's a lot of challenges with enforcement. Um, right. Uh, so Randy Purley is uh, with the tribal security team and he um, uh, will not uh, remove band members. Uh, he'll leave that to the RCMP is what he said, but he'll, he'll remove non-band members and so far mm -hmm. he's kicked around um, a dozen people off the reserve. Um, but he actually got into an altercation with one of those people and he ended up charged. So you can kind of see that there's like legally there's, uh, it's going to be difficult to enforce. Um, uh, and I could tell, you know, I was in the community, uh, you know, for a few days. It's everyone is impacted, right? There's complicated uh, kinship ties, and these are people that you know you grew up with. Mm -hmm. So emotionally, uh, it's difficult. They haven't banished a band member yet. I think that time is coming. Um, so the chief said, you know, it's maybe still a little too early to to tell uh, in the long run how it will how it will work out. So Trina, how realistic is it for First Nations to do this across the country? You know, I think um, I talked with a Mi'kmaq lawyer, Duma Young, uh, who raised some <coughs> really interesting questions around, um, you know, a lot of times drug dealers are selling drugs, they're small time dealers who are selling drugs to support their own habit because they themselves uh, uh, have a, an addiction. Right. And so, you know, are you cutting them off from important services that could help them? Um, you know, in Tobik, uh, it's a council of elders that decides if someone gets banished. Um, but but the, you know the, you have to be convicted of a crime. So so you know are you punishing an indigenous person twice if they're you know if they go to jail and are also banished? Um, I talked although I went to Tobik, I did talk to a lot of people uh, from indigenous communities across the country, and particularly in Saskatchewan, where several First Nations have looked at this. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I heard uh, a, a sort of a common theme was that, I mean, this isn't the, you know, uh, although it's an ancient 
uh, legal concept. Um, in the modern day, you know, there's no, you're not banished into the wild. Right. You're, it's, it's, you know, you're just, uh, where do you go when you leave the reserve? And so sometimes it just shifts the problem to, to another community. I just think at this point there's, there's more questions than answers, um, and it's a complicated issue legally and emotionally, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out with some of the communities that are trying it. Well, Trina, it's a great idea for an episode of APTN Investigates. So I'll just say uh, congrats on your numerous nominations as well. I appreciate you taking some time Thanks, to speak Dennis. with us here. Thank you, Dennis. Time for another quick break, but stick around. There's more to come. Here's the rest of your Saturday forecast. Picking back up in northern Alberta, sunny and 14 above for Fort McMurray. Plus 17 with showers in Medicine Hat, sunny, and 15 for Edmonton. Showers for Vancouver with a high of 11, plus 10, and showers for Bella Coola. Sunny and 6 for Deese Lake, looks like snow in Prince George. Plus 3 in Old Crow, minus 3 for Rock River, plus 9 in Whitehorse. 11 above with showers for Fort Liard and Trout Lake, zero with snow in Norman Wells. Minus 17 for Saks Harbor, 13 below in Politak. Minus 3 for Baker Lake, 0 for Arviette and Whale Cove. Minus 21 in Arctic Bay, minus 15 in Clyde River. Welcome back. Researchers in Antarctica are planning to retrieve the world's oldest ice. Scientists believe the ice in an area of Antarctica identified as Little Dome Sea is one and a half million years old. Robert Mulvaney is a climate scientist with the British Antarctic Survey and the UK, led, uh, and the UK lead on the project. He says an ice core that old will be crucial in helping scientists understand past climate changes. We're effectively running a, a forecasting model. We're, we're trying to do a very, very long range, re range weather forecast. Now, what we do is we take what we expect the, the atmosphere, what the levels of carbon dioxide and methane, the greenhouse gases, we expect that what we expect them to look like in 100 years' time and try to predict what the climate would look like based on those levels of, of, of greenhouse gases. What we can also do is to look back into the past when we see similar levels of carbon dioxide and look what the climate looked like then. So it's, if you like, it's a way of testing the models that predict the future. Current ice core measurements provide reliable data going back only about 800,000 years compared to one and a half million years this sample could yield. Well, that's your APTN National News for this Friday. For much more, visit our website, aptnnews.ca, and download the APTN News app. I'm Dennis Ward. Have a great weekend.